Good day, everybody. We are officially going to uh, have our first video here for our little series on the presidents that we have decided to begin. So, as anyone will probably know, if you know anything about the president, you probably at least have been taught who, of course, was our very first, and that is none other than probably one of the most famous figures in all of American history and even in world history, and that is none other than George Washington. Now, I know that most people probably know George Washington, but I know that some people don't even know all their currency money either, so I'm going to start off right now and show you this. <laughs> I'm literally I'm literally doing it. George Washington is the guy that is on your quarters. I'm making sure we know this because there's a lot of people that unfortunately still don't know. This is your quarter. He's on your quarter. He is also on your dollar bill. Gotta make sure we know that. Anyway, so today we will go ahead here and discuss the very first uh, president of the United States, what exactly happened during President Washington's uh, administration, what exactly did he accomplish, did he have any failures, what, what exactly impact did he have on the nation during his two terms as president. Now, of course, Washington is going to be mostly a president. Uh, precedent setter because he was the very first president. He was the first one to ever hold the position and thus a lot of people really at that time didn't exactly know what the responsibilities of a president were. They didn't really know what a president was supposed to do and it kind of fell onto Washington to kind of set precedents for future presidents of, and future holders of the office basically to follow. What did he think the president should do? What, how did he think the president should conduct business? Basically, and a lot of what Washington did was basically setting a precedent. So it wasn't stuff that was real rooted in tradition. It was stuff that Washington kind of came up with or the Constitution delegated, because I'm going to make this clear again. The Constitution is kind of loosely. Uh, it's got a loose interpretation, almost literally. It states some of the basic things that you can and cannot do, but anything that it does not specifically mention that you can't do that's up to debate because there's certain there's a lot of things that the constitution does not specifically mention is somebody's responsibility or someone has the authority to do and since it don't really make no mention of it you really got to start asking yourself and kind of deciding and figuring out okay so who who has authority to do this because the constitution don't really tell us so it's really the basic principle of implied powers so anyway before we really get into George Washington's presidency of course I just want to go back here Briefly, and discuss a little bit of his background. Of course, most people probably know his background, so we're not really going to spend a whole lot on this. It's just mostly kind of some important events that happened prior to him becoming president in 1789. So, to start off with is, of course, when George Washington was born. He was born in 1732 in February. Now, you can debate the date, given the fact that there was a different calendar in use at the time. But today, we celebrate Washington's birthday as being on February 22nd. But anyway, the year was right, and he was born in 17, 1732 to a wealthy planter family in the co British colony of Virginia. Upon the death of George's father, Ag Augustus, at age 11, George was only 11 years old when his dad died, George became very close with his older half-brother, Lawrence. His mother was his father's second wife, and prior to marrying her, his father had married another woman and had some children with her, of which he had Lawrence, who became a half-brother to George upon his birth, and after the death of his dad, George became very close with his half-brother. At age 16, Washington became a surveyor, and he mapped out land in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. He would constantly go out on little surveying trips with his partner and kind of survey, actually map out the land. Washington eventually also came to live with his older half-brother a few years later down in his life at his mansion, at his brother's mansion of Mount Vernon, which of course you probably recognize as George Washington's home, which of course is his home, and he inherited this from Lawrence when his when Lawrence died in 1752. Of uh, I forget what it was. He died of a sickness. I know that. I forget what sickness though. But upon Lawrence's death, Lawrence dictated that the mansion was to go to the mansion, the grounds, the property, and even the slaves were to go to George. So George inherited his home from his br older half brother. <laughs> 
Starting in 1754, Washington served as a colonel in the colonial militia during the French and Indian War between Britain and France, which was just a small category of the larger Seven Years' War that was going on worldwide. Of course, we did do a video of that a little while back during the summer, so if you want to check that out, I will be sure to uh, provide that here at the end of the video, or you can just go back yourself and look through it. Um, Washington served as a colonel in the British Army at that time. He actually was essential in the capture of Fort Duquesne, which was a French outpost in what is now Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was not there at the time, of course. Um, he resigned from the British Army in 1758, although the war was not over yet at that time. Washington did decide to resign his commission, and at age 26, he married a wealthy 27-year-old widow named Martha Dandridge Custis, on January 6th of 1759, George and Martha. Martha Washington was George's wife, and they had probably one of the longest and most happy marriages of any presidential couple. He and Martha had a happy marriage. They did raise uh, Martha's children from her previous marriage. They did not have children of their own, but he, they did raise Martha's uh, prior children from her prior marriage. And they also helped raise the, their grandchildren that eventually the Martha's children had. So although they'd had no children of their own, George and Martha did help raise her older kids and their grandchildren. Washington later served in the Virginia House of Burgesses, which was the Virginia colonial legislature, and became one of the wealthiest landowners in the colony. And of course, during the Revolution, uh, Washington held very much many sympathies and uh, thoughts that were ideal with the colonial revolutionaries, and during the American Revolution, as we all know, he did serve as the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army from 1775 until the end of the war in 1783, and it was because of Washington that we largely won the war, as he was the one that did win the Battle of Yorktown in 1781 that finally kind of forced the British to accept defeat in North America. Washington had also presided as president of the Constitutional Convention in 1787 when the convention was convened to originally um, edit the Articles of Confederation, but eventually they kind of came to the conclusion that we probably need to just go ahead and abolish them and replace them with a different form of government. So George was also very instrumental in the crafting of the Constitution, and he did sign it. He signed, If you look at the Constitution, each... Each of the delegates are named listed under the states, and George's signature is, of course, under – well, actually, his is under president, if I remember right. He's the only one that wasn't under a state. So that brings us up to about 1789, because the Constitution – that brings us to 1787, so about two years before. So we will go ahead and kind of delve into here of how Washington even got elected in the first place. After the Constitution had been ratified by at least nine states, as was quite required for it to go into effect in 1788, Washington very much had wanted to return to private life at Mount Vernon. He was very much thought that he could retire. He re really didn't want any more to do with the leadership. He had served in the Revolution. He had helped come. He'd come back to help form this new government. He thought, "I've done my job. I just want to go home. I'm I'm tired." However, the nation had different plans for Washington, of course, at that time. Between December 15th, 1788 and January 10th of 1789, the nation held its very first presidential election to decide who would be declared the country's first president under the new government that had been established under the Constitution. Washington was not the only candidate on the ballot. There were others, such as John Adams, Benjamin Lincoln, John Jay, John Hancock, and George Clinton. However, Washington was immensely popular compared to the other candidates. I mean immensely. And this was mostly due to the factor that Washington was, of course, he was the hero of the revolution. People admired Washington for how he had won them independence, and they admired him for helping to craft the Constitution as well. He was probably the most popular figure in America at that time. There wasn't one person that probably would say a bad thing about him in any way. So he has a very big advantage over the other candidates on this ballot. And the Electoral College at this time, as we all know, the Electoral College kind of decides presidential elections, especially if you've been watching the one that took place just a couple weeks ago. And we're still debating about, but that's a whole other topic. But anyway, today, a majority of the Electoral College is 270 votes. 
Back then, the Electoral College, cons and I think today, it consists of a total of 500-some electors. Well, back then, the ele of course, this is based off the number of states and the population of those states, so back then, there's going to be a lot less. So when the very first presidential election came, the Electoral College only had 69 electors in it. So you needed a majority, so you roughly needed a little bit over 30 to get somewhere in the 30s, but it would be a majority, I believe. And each elector would cast two votes each. Each elector had two votes. They could put them both for the same candidate or whatever they wanted to choose. And keep in mind at this time that president, uh, nominee, uh, presidential candidates did not run with a running mate. They didn't choose a running mate to become their vice president. At this point in time, The whoever won, the, it was mostly like this. Whoever got the most votes nationally would be president, and whoever got the second most votes would become vice president. So that also created an odd situation where you might have a president who is entirely on the different opposite political view of his vice president. So that quickly got changed in the early 19th century, which we will cover when we get to Thomas Jefferson here just two presidents later. Now, Washington was unanimously, unanimously elected with one vote from each of the 69 electors, so he received 69 votes. He is the only presidential candidate and president in history, in American history, he is the only president to ever win election with a unanimous vote, meaning no one voted against him. No one said no to Washington. He is the only president to have that honor and distinction. John Adams, who received the second most at 34 votes, because keep in mind, each elector has two votes. And Washington won a vote from each of the 69, but they still have another vote they got to cast. And for that, they cast it for another candidate, because they could not cast both votes for the same candidate. So wh who gets the second spot is John Adams of Massachusetts, who you may recall was a good friend of Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, had half helped craft the Declaration of Independence. And he was very influential, of course, just very famous as well, just like Washington, and he was admired as well. And he receives the second most at votes with 34, so he becomes the vice president to George Washington. So we have our first official president, we have Washington, and then we have our first official vice president, who is John Adams. Now... Of course, Washington did not know immediately. He was informed of this by the, the uh, Congress kind of sent a message to Washington to inform him of his win, and he could accept whether or not he would actually serve as president, but whether he'd be willing. And he was very hesitant to actually do so because, again, as we stated, George thought he had done enough. He really didn't want to be in the public eye anymore. He wanted to just kind of retire and live his life at, at his farm. He really just wanted to live at home. But... Luckily, Washington kind of said, you know what, they elected me unanimously, it's obvious the people want me to serve for them, I will do it, I will do it here as I have always done. So on April 16th, Washington officially sets out from Mount Vernon to the federal capital of New York City to attend his inauguration. Now, I, now you may be reeling your head a little bit right here, right now, and you're like, wait a minute, federal capital of New York City? I thought Washington, D.C. is our capital. Well, I'd like to give you this a little bit. Washington, D.C. did not exist at this time. When the nation first f was cre uh, formed under the uh, Constitution, when the new Constitution was put into place, New York City was our nation's first capital. Yeah, I, it's hard to believe. But it was our first capital at the time, and then it kind of start, sparked a debate. There was a debate between the southern states and the northern states. And this debate centered over where the capital was. The southerners claimed the capital was far too far north, and they wanted it somewhere in, on the border between Maryland and Virginia, about, about halfway in the country. But it would still be considered a southern capital, while the north, of course, they had the power there. They didn't want to give them rid of it. So they had to come to a compromise of sorts, and which was the United States assuming the southern states' debt and in return a southern capital. Well, no, the northern states would accept the debt, debt would allow the United States to accept the uh, debt of the southern states that they had incurred during the revolution. So basically, 
uh, all the states, including North and South, will get their debts paid, were covered by the government, which f benefited the North, and the South was allowed to take a capital to in that little border area between Maryland and Virginia, which was actually planned and laid out in what was then Swamp on the Potomac River, and that eventually became our nation's capital of Washington, D.C. George Washington actually helped plan the layout of Washington, D.C., and he did help plan the designs for the White House, but he did not ever live there. He is the only president to never live in the White House. The White House did not exist during Washington's term. He's the only president to not live in the White House or Washington, D.C., but he did, he did go to Washington, D.C. when it was being constructed to help kind of direct the efforts to build the city up and kind of design things. So at this time, New York City is our capital. So on April 30th, 1789, Washington formally took the oath of office at New York City's Federal Hall near Wall Street and then went indoors to deliver his inaugural address to the Congress. He wore a brown suit, I believe, is what I've read. He wore a brown suit, and he also wore a ceremonial sword on his hip as he gave this address. Before we go on here, we'll go ahead and show two images I want to kind of show that are related to what we've just already discussed. Here is your very, we're going to have one of these in every president that we do because I feel it's important to know how each one won. So this was the very first presidential election in 1789, 1788, 1789, since it technically is two years. This just kind of shows you the electoral votes that each state had and who won each state. Now the black was mostly because in New York's case, they had just been admitted, and they couldn't quite come to a decision of how they chose their electors, so New York did not actually kind of vote in this election, not because they were barred from it, but because they did not decide how to choose their electors in time. And then North Carolina had not been admitted as a state yet either, neither was Rhode Island. They had not ratified the Constitution. North Carolina had not ratified the Constitution. New York had, but it was having a little problem determining how to choose. But this is basically who won each. Maine was part of Massachusetts at that time, just so everyone knows. But this is who won each of those states. Of course, Georgia was a lot bigger then than it is now. Virginia was a lot bigger then than it is now. Of course, this is now Kentucky, and this is uh, not just Georgia, but you got Mississippi and Alabama in there. But yeah, this pretty much shows you who won each state in the very first presidential election. And as you can see... It was Washington all the way through. No one else won. It just kind of shows you the votes. Now, when we get to our second president, John Adams, you'll actually see a difference. And you'll see a difference in every presidential election that we show from here on out. This is the only one you're going to see that in. And we also have a little portrait here. Of This is a portrait of Washington. It's kind of faded, but it shows it of him taking his inaugural address on at the Federal Hall in New York City on April 30th as first president of the United States. Washington is right here in the brown suit. Now, why did the people choose Washington? Well, they chose him for a very specific reason that was kind of true, and if you really think about it, it made sense. The people feared that a president could become a king, because keep in mind, the United States was a brand new concept at this time, and nowhere in the world was there an executive office called the president. We were the first one to have a thing called the president. So people really didn't know what a president was. And the big fear was, well, a president might become like a king. He might become a monarch or a dictator. And they were very careful, like, well, who should, we, who should fill that be the first to fill that position. Who can we trust? And they really trusted George Washington because they're like, well, we know he's not going to seize power because he didn't. He had the opportunity before and passed it down after the revolution. If Washington really wanted to, he had an army at his disposal. He could have seized power for himself. And some people had even asked him to become a king, and Washington had declined. And they let and they basically reasoned that literally the guy turned down power once. He'll turn it down again. So that was really one of the big driving reasons as to why they elected Washington is because they knew they could trust the man that he wouldn't try to become a king. He wouldn't try to become a monarch. 
So Washington starts out his presidency and just to, here's a very admirable thing Washington did kind of he insisted to Congress that he wanted to serve without pay. Washington did not want to have to have Congress pay him a salary to serve as president like they do nowadays. Of course, nowadays you're like, yeah, I'm president. I want the money. I want the money. Well, Washington was probably the only president that said, I don't want the money. And Congress said, oh, no, you're getting the money. Probably the only time they've agreed on something. <laughs> it's probably true. <laughs> but it's the only time that I think they've really agreed on something and said, we don't care what you say, we're paying you. <laughs> hey, you're going to pay me, fine. Fine. I like to be paid. <laughs> but Washington did not. But Congress insisted that he earn a sal that he get a salary, and they eventually settled that they would pay him twenty five thousand dollars per year at, for each year that he was president, which in today's money is about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So keep in mind, inflation's happened a lot since, so money back then was worth a lot more. <laughs> Now, Washington's presidency was, as we mentioned at the very beginning of this video, it's going to be one, it's full of historic firsts. It's full of precedents getting set for future ones to follow. Now, we're going to first look at what were the precedents that Washington set, the presidential precedents, such as how a president should act. We're not even going to get to the government phase here yet. Today, what do you think of a president when you look of what they do? And you're going to think of, well, if a president's meeting somebody, he typically shakes hands with somebody. And you call them, you refer to them as Mr. President. Well, today that's commonplace. We don't think nothing of it. That's a tradition. Well, think back then. Back then, none of this was in place. No one had ever known what a president was, and we were really kind of determining what exactly was the right point of call here. So, and then of course you also like today for travel. You will view the president. Well, he either is in the Air Force One or he's probably in the big limo. The beast, as they call it, I think. Well, George and Martha commonly would travel around in stagecoaches like European monarchs around New York City, which, of course, has spawned a little bit of criticism because people are saying, well, you're acting just like a monarch in Europe would. But, but believe me, this was not by George's choice. I mean, they didn't have cars back then, so how else are you going to get around? Washington also believed that there was a certain dignity that came with the office of the president, and he very much tried to uh, impart this behavior to the office, and he tried to impart that behavior to future office holders that you need to have a certain dignity by holding this office. And it's very much, I think it's been a concept that has largely survived to this day. Which, of course, you can debate on the current president, and even I will at times, because, and I'm not going to be afraid to say this once, but in my opinion, from what I've seen of our current president, of President Trump, he's kind of been a norm breaker. He's not exactly adhered to a lot of the customs that most presidents have done. He's largely been kind of his rules, his game. It's not, it's basically like he says, oh, traditions, well, that's that's nice, but guess what, I, I, I'm not listening, I'm doing what I want to do. Which is nothing that says you can't do that. I'm just kind of making the point that until recently, no president has really not deviated from that path until this one. This one is probably the first one I can recall that kind of deviates from that path and says, yeah, the heck with tradition, I ain't following it. I'll do what I want to do. But that is basically on that. Now, what else happens here is... Washington, of course, we mentioned he thinks there's a dignity, so this also shapes how he kind of goes about greeting people. As we mentioned, today you're probably thinking, well, the president meets somebody, he shakes hands with them, and they refer to him as Mr. President. Well, George never shook hands with anybody. If he was meeting somebody, if he was meeting and receiving guests, George Washington did not shake hands with visitors. He instead did a courtly bow with his visitor, and he would be standing on a raised platform displaying a sword on his hip if he was receiving a guest. So he was kind of a little bit sophisticated when you met the president. It wasn't a simple handshake. It was bow, and then whatever else you do. It was more sophisticated. And John Adams largely carried this over too. It wasn't really until Thomas Jefferson that we had some of the normalities come about, such as handshaking, and Jefferson was also the one that got rid of the wig, thank God. 
I mean, no offense, but I don't know why we wore wigs. But Thomas Jefferson was the first president to come into office and say, you know what? Heck with the wig. <laughs> Take the wig off. But he was the first one to really... It wasn't until Thomas Jefferson that we really had some of the more normal norms come about. But Washington never shook hands. You had to... When you greeted him, you bowed. You didn't shake hands at all. And he would stand on a raised platform with a sword on his hip. It was a ceremonial sword, not an actual military sword that was actually going to be used to kill you. And then we have the question of how do we address the president when we meet him? Do we? What do we call him? And people had many ideas. They were two of the most prevalent words you could call him, Your Excellency, or His Majesty, the President, which of course to me sounds like a monarch. And of course that struck a lot of chords with a lot of people, and it was just a constant debate until Washington was ultimately the one that decided what he would be addressed as, and it really it has stuck ever since. And Washington decided, I don't care what fancy name you think, but I'm telling you right now, the one I will answer to is Mr. President. And the name has stuck ever since. When you address the president, you call him Mr. President. You don't say His Majesty the President. You don't say Your Excellency. Your Highness. You don't say any of that. You just say Mr. President. And Washington was the one that set that precedent forward. Washington did also start the little precedent of selecting a group of advisors to really help him shape his gov governing policy. And he selected these advisors to help him run the country more efficiently, and this eventually becomes known as the President's Cabinet, as we mentioned in our very introductionary video. Now, today the Cabinet meant numbers over 20 or 30-some members, but back in Washington's administration, there were only four members. There were only four positions in the cabinet. And Washington's very first four members of the original presidential cab cabinet were... We had Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton, who was in charge of the country's finances and banks and money. We had Thomas Jefferson as our first Secretary of State, who was basically in charge of foreign affairs, as would shape a large part of Washington's presidency, which we'll get to here later. A little, not a large part, but it would also he would set a pre precedent in that area in his presidency. So he was responsible for relations with foreign countries. Henry Knox was selected as our first Secretary of War, which is today is known as the Secretary of Defense. They have changed the name over the years, but it was originally called the Secretary of War. And then we also had Edmund Randolph as our first Attorney General, who, of course, law enforcement, stuff like that. And if you want to see here, we have an image of the first cabinet of Washington with his very first cabinet members who became his most trusted advisors during his, pre for, at least during his first term. We had Washington here, then you had Henry Knox, our Secretary of War, Alexander Hamilton, who's on your $10 bill, who our first Secretary of the Treasury, of course, you probably know this guy, Thomas Jefferson, who would actually go on to be our third president, and then we had Edmund Randolph, who was our first Attorney General. They all helped Washington to govern the country better and make better policies. Now, with this done, Washington's administration began a very smooth run it kicked to kick off his administration, and that was until 1790 when Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton was really started the first uh, cabinet debate when he proposed the creation of a national bank. And at the same time, he called for the federal government to kind of adopt and assume the state debts that each individual state had kind of accumulated during the revolution to maybe other foreign nations, such as France, for instance. Now, Thomas Jefferson, the Secretary of State, was very much opposed to Hamilton's plan, as he viewed that the government really shouldn't have that much control over people's finances with a national bank, which would put all the, all the banks of the nation into one national controlled bank. But Washington eventually sided with Hamilton, and thus when Congress actually introduced a bill to create a national bank and charter one, Washington signed the bill. So a national bank was created, and today you may notice, you're like, well, we don't have a national bank today. And no, we don't. And that was because of Andrew Jackson, who I covered earlier this year, which I will also, well, I won't know that one, but you can go back and look at that. And we will probably discuss it again when we get to his presidency. He was our seventh president. So from, about 17, from the 1790s until the 1830s, we had a national bank of the United States.
However, it kind of caused financial panic because other banks kind of realized that they were going to be superseded and kind of went out of business and a little bit of a financial crisis incurred, ensued. Now, the rift between Hamilton and Jefferson eventually got to the point that it started to form political parties as each one's followers started to kind of diverge themselves. And the two and the two very first political parties also began to form in the, in the United States, with Hamilton leading the Federalist Party and Jefferson coming to lead what was called the Democratic Republican Party. These were the first two uh, political parties in the nation. The Federalists have no descendants today, but the Democratic Republicans are the ancestors to the Democratic Party. So the Democrats can trace their heritage all the way back to Thomas Jefferson. And this rift gets eventually so large that Jefferson kind of feels that Washington constantly would side with Hamilton, and he resigns from his position as Secretary of State later in the first term of Washington's presidency. Washington urged him not to, and they did. He departed on good terms with Washington. He didn't yell at him or nothing, but he just said, "I can't remain here anymore because you're not always just listening to what I have to say, and I feel I just need to go on." So he resigned from his post as Secretary of State. Washington continued with presidential affairs after this little cabinet debate, and he would also continue to set precedents. He appointed our very first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court as the Constitution delegated that he could do so, as he nominated John Jay of New York to do, to become that very first Chief Justice, of which the Senate did officially confirm, and he did get the position. And at the same time, he set precedents, such as he did set the precedent that if you wanted to meet with the President, you had to meet with him by appointment. And Friday afternoons were for receptions. He would have receptions at the president's house as he lived in about three different houses in New York City throughout his terms in office. He really didn't have an official residence, so he would constantly live in a little bit of a different house each time that he could afford or that the government would provide at times. And at the same time, you had the Indian Wars in what is now Ohio, which of course was a whole other matter. And eventually, that was the Indians here in the, on my state of Ohio. At the time, Ohio was not a state yet; it was still a territory. The Indians here, such as the Delaware and the Shawnee and the my, do excuse me, the Miami Wyandots, they were very much against the American settlement that was coming into Ohio. They started kind of reacting violently, trying to push the settlement back. Washington sent troops to Ohio, who were pushed back in seven, the early 1790s at the Battle of Fort Recovery near the Wabash River. And I think that was about 1791, 1792. Eventually, the Indians in Ohio were for, were formally uh, dis, kind of defeated in 1794 with the Battle of Fallen Timbers up near Maumee to, in Toledo, Ohio. And that eventually, a year later, the Treaty of Greenville was signed, which eventually kind of cleared the way for American settlement of most of the two-thirds of Ohio, except for the upper little Toledo quadrant. Which, of course, I did go up and see the battle site back this past August. I did not get to walk the, really the whole thing, but I hope to do that here next year. So hopefully I will get to have a video on that at some point. In 1793, Washington was convinced by Thomas Jefferson to serve a second term, even though he really didn't want to. He really just wanted to go home again. He really was just kind of sick of being in the public eye. And Thomas Jefferson was the one that convinced him to run for a second term in 1793, telling him that the country's starting to fracture. I don't know if it'll survive unless you are in charge. And because of that, Washington agreed that he would serve another term. And of course, he won re-election easily later that year. Now, I also want to point out that Washington did not always get his way. And you might think, well, he's such a great man. He was admired by everybody. Well, he didn't always get his way. And for one instance, I did not know this, and I found this a very peculiar story, was there was a time that Washington actually lost his temper right in front of the Senate. And this happened on one of the occasions that he had a Indian treaty that had been that he had signed with an Indian tribe in the uh, West. And Washington called the Senate into session. He called them into session. He went to the Senate chamber that was in whatever building they use in New York. I think it was still the Federal Hall. But he went to the Senate chamber with this treaty in hand. And he ex basically was expecting that the Senate would ratify that treaty right then and there in front of him. 
which by the Constitution, as you may remember, the president can help negotiate and sign a treaty, but the the only way it can be formally ratified is by a two-thirds vote in the Senate. The president cannot choose to ratify it on his own authority. So, of course, he's bringing it to the Senate. He's like, oh, they'll, 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 yeah, they'll ratify it right here. Well, the Senate, after he gives a big old long speech, the Senate members kind of inform him that we're not exactly voting on this today. We will make a time, our own timetable of sorts of when we will hold a vote on ratification of that treaty. They didn't say we weren't going to vote for that treaty. They were just kind of telling Washington that we will make our own schedule here. You don't make our schedule. And Washington kind of lost his temper a little bit. And he <laughs> he literally told them, he's like, well, this defeats my whole the whole purpose of my coming here. And I'll be damned if I'll ever do it again. Those were his actual words. I'll be damned if I ever do it again. And guess what? Washington never did do it again. And when he next time he had treaties, he let the Senate do its own timetable. He never went again. Never again did he go and go before the Senate and whip a treaty or anything like that. He was just kind of stayed away. And no president has ever since. He was the only one to ever really do that, to kind of come to the Senate and expect them to ratify it right then and there when he requested it. And they kind of made it clear that we'll ratify it at our own timetable that we create. Now, as I mentioned, Washington got reelected in 1793. Now, his second term is not viewed as positively as the first term. And this was because there were two major crises that soon, crises that soon dominated his second term. And the first one happens in the very year of the re-election, and that was you had the uh, England and France were once again going at war with each other. Of course, France had just come out, was, st was still in the French Revolution at that time, and England was just, and the other European powers in general, becoming very uh, cautious of revolutionary France. And so, of course, as always, Britain and France start going to war again, and they try to entice the United States to get involved in the conflict, knowing that if they could try to draw the United States in, it might destroy it, because it was kind of a new young nation that was quite weak militarily. Well... Many Americans did feel some loyalty to the French, given the fact that the French had helped them during the American Revolution, especially those who were Democratic Republicans, such as Jefferson, who believed that the United States should help France. And of course, we did just fight against Britain for independence, but the, the Federalists believed that Britain was probably more on the right because they believed that the revolutionary French, since they had executed their king, kind of turned into uh, radical mobs. They kind of deemed that we really want to side with a bunch of crazies. So there was ample support for both sides in America. And the, uh, of course, the decision was ultimately going to come, come down to Congress in Washington. But Washington was going to be commander of, army if, in, of the army if, in case anything happened. And of course, Washington was very much against the war. And it was because he realized the United States was a very young nation. It really didn't have, I don't even think it had a thousand man army at that time. I, don't, I think the army was under a thousand men. And he kind of realized, if we go ahead and get in the war, we're done. This, this experiment will be over in democracy. So he, Washington did something that was very, somewhat, con, uh, what would be the word here? It was somewhat contested. It was somewhat controversial at that time because it really wasn't known as it was the first time that he really uh, took uh, the notion of implied powers from the Constitution and kind of exercise that right, and he issued in a neutrality pact. A neutrality statement is what he issued, and it stated that the United States would be neutral in the conflict between Britain and France and expected full trading rights with both, but it was not going to get involved. It was, new it was a neutral nation. Now, of course, this spawned debate, especially in Congress, because some started to realize, like, well, what authority do you have to dictate foreign policy? And the Constitution didn't explicitly say that the president was directly in charge of foreign policy, but it did somewhat imply it. So Washington kind of took it as, well, if the Constitution implies it and there ain't nothing that says I can't not do it in this case, and there's nothing in there that says the con that the Congress can uh, uh, dictate foreign policy, I'm going to go ahead and do something. And that precedent has largely survived to this day, and it very much has survived to this day, as it, today it is the norm that it is known that who directs foreign policy for the United States, it's the office of the president. Congress has no say. 
The president dictates foreign policy. He runs it. So Washington was really responsible for the first exercise of that uh, implied power. But of course, it spawned some criticism from those around him. And then shortly after, he had another thing, where in 1794, you had farmers in Pennsylvania begin rioting and f forming a militia of rebels in response to a whiskey tax in what was known as the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794. These farmers had kind of had a whiskey tax imposed on them, which they usually would use their excess surplus corn, sell that off to make whiskey, and then sell that off as barter to try to trade for goods that they actually needed or to pay off things, and now this tax is starting to interfere with their revenue. So, of course, the farmers are angry, and they start rioting, get, getting violent, they start burning towns down, they start tar and feathering tax collectors like they had done during the American Revolution, and eventually it gets to the point that Washington himself calls in the army, and he actually sets out on horseback in person with the troops to go quell this rebellion in Pennsylvania. He will lead the army himself. As soon as word comes to the rebels in Pennsylvania that Washington is marching out with an army to meet them, they disperse before he even ever gets there. Not a shot was fired. But it was, it was a very big thing on Washington's part that he showed the power of the federal government that it was willing to take action to make sure that the stable stability of the country remained. But it also spurned criticism by some because they deemed that it was kind of unnecessary to get the army involved in such a small matter as they deemed it. In 1795, Washington set probably what was probably the worst uh, receptive, worst received uh, action of his administration, and this was in 1795, two years before he would leave office for his, of his second term. And Washington faced extreme criticism for the Jay Treaty that was signed in 1795. It was negotiated with the British it was a treaty between the United States and Great Britain that was kind of negotiated by Chief Justice uh, John Jay, who was also a diplomat. And he had, in the Jay Treaty with Britain, it kind of was setting out to kind of solve some outstanding issues that were still left from the American Revolution. And in that, one of the demands was that Britain was going to evacuate it, the force within American territory, especially in the Ohio and Northwest Territory regions that they had still had in what was technically American territory, but had refused to evacuate their forts. That in this treaty, Britain agreed that they would evacuate those forts, but there was something that it failed on. And the other part of the negotiations was that due to the war of Britain and France, trade with the West Indies, the Caribbean had kind of been slowed down and kind of been hampered due to the ongoing war, and that was a big source of profit for a lot of American merchants, so they kind of wanted to, the United States wanted to, of course, reopen the trade route with the West Indies fully, and then, of course, there were the early seizures by the British of American merchant vessels for deserters and something like that, like we discussed in our War of 1812 video. Well, Washington's J... Uh, Washington's administration helped negotiate and sign the Jay Treaty, and Congress did officially ratify it. However, it had a very big shortcoming, and that was while it did have the British agree to withdraw and evacuate from their forts in the American territories that were left, they only agreed to partially open up the West Indies, not fully like they had demanded, and it did not stop the British from seizing American merchant vessels at all. And this infuriated a lot of Americans. They deemed that this was a betrayal of what we wanted. And they also started attacking Washington with criticism, largely for the first time in his life, that it actually got to him a little bit. He was not a man that was used to being criticized in any way. And people actually called him a betrayer of the revolution, that he's a dupe of King George. And the Jay Treaty was very much a disaster for the, for the Washington administration. It was probably the only bad thing that he really did. Now, right here we have a photo, uh, not a photo, but a portrait of John Jay, who served, who was the main negotiator of the Jay Treaty. I think he was, he also negotiated the 1783 Treaty of Paris that officially recognized the United States as a new independent nation. And he, of course, also served as the first Chief Justice of our Supreme Court. This was John Jay. Now, well, during his final year in office in 1796, Washington kind of largely left aside. He didn't really do a lot of big things. He was more concerned with helping planning the 
uh, building and construction of the nation's capital of what was soon to bear his name as Washington, D.C. It did not bear his name in his lifetime, but it was shortly after his death that they did go ahead and give it that name. Actually, no. I take that back. They were they told Washington what they were planned on naming it just before he died, and he did know when he died that the city was going to be named in his honor. But during his final year in office in 1796, Washington kept overseeing, he did a large part of overseeing the planning and the construction of the federal capital, and he gave some suggestions, especially for the, what was then called the Executive Mansion, but what is today called the White House. And I did not know this, but apparently we get our, the Oval Office, we can thank George Washington basically for the Oval Office and other oval-shaped rooms in the White House because Washington had, had them incorporate oval-shaped rooms into the White House plans for the original White House because for, he liked the shape of an oval room. And thus, that was really his brainchild that there is even rooms in the White House that are an oval shape, such as the Oval Office. So we kind of get that from George Washington. He was a very big fan of oval rooms. Why? I don't exactly know. Now, Washington's administration did also in his final year secure a deal with Spain that was well received, and that was that in the Treaty of San Lorenzo of 1796, he with, and the United States signed a treaty, this treaty with Spain that year that officially opened up the Mississippi River and the port of New Orleans fully to American commerce. Americans could trade freely on the Mississippi River and on the and at the Port of New Orleans, which was vital to settlers in the frontier. Washington decided to step down the following year after he had served two terms, despite the fact that many people wanted him to serve a third. And honestly, I think Washington probably could have served as a president until uh, the literally until he died. But Washington set a very big precedent then and there. He decided, no, I've done enough. I am not serving anymore. Someone else needs to take the reins. He wanted to just retire, and this time he was finally going to do it. And sure enough, Washington did only serve two terms. And this set was set as the precedent for years, as no president served more than two terms. Very, there was very few that even ran for a third. From 1797, when Washington left office, until 1933, there was no president that ever served more than two terms. Until we had FDR. FDR served four terms. He died during his fourth term, and it was, and eventually Washington's president, precedent became enshrined in the Constitution in 1951 with the passage of the 22nd Amendment that officially limited a president to two terms. Before then, there was no, nothing in the Constitution that said you were limited to two terms. You could run for more. So Franklin Roosevelt did it legally. He could have run. And Theodore Roosevelt ran for a third, too, as did Ulysses Grant. At that time, it was legal. You could do that. But nowadays, that is not legal. Washington's president has been enshrined into the Constitution. In his farewell address that Washington gave to the nation... As he was beginning getting ready to leave office, he stressed two major things. He stressed that the, the, the nation needed to stay out of European wars and affairs, and he also stressed, and I think this is very good advice for it, it's very concurrent to today, especially today, is that he urged that U.S. citizens needed to put aside the party divisions that divided them at the time, and they needed to work together towards the common good. Someone might want to tell the Democrats and Republicans that. Instead of sitting there in Congress with literally your butt on the wall, just sitting there and go, Ooh, I don't like you, I don't like you. Yeah, nothing gets done. I'm still waiting on a second stimulus. And I blame both parties. Because neither of them can do anything. They're stubborn. Both. They don't know how to work together. And that's something George Washington told them to do. It's a shame. But anyway, this was the two things that Washington expressed in his farewell address. And his avoidance, his advice to stay out of European wars largely would remain also true until World War I in 1917 when we entered that. So both of these presidents were followed for a large portion of time. Although one could very much be followed today and most people just don't do it. But Washington, and may I also add that political parties were a very big thing when they first came about, when these first two political parties came about, because at the t when the Constitution was written, none of the founders, none of them, 
ever imagined that there would ever be political parties. The Constitution did not anticipate the formation of political parties at all, and thus the system of government that we have was not exactly designed for it. That's why it sometimes works so oddly, is because it was not designed with the idea in mind of political parties forming. That's just something that happened unexpectedly. Washington did officially retire in March of 1797 when he officially left office upon the next president coming in, which was John Adams, which we will discuss in our next video on in this series when we do that. And eventually, he retired to Mount Vernon, and he lived there for the next two years of his life. He would entertain and have guests come over. He would entertain them. He worked on his farm, would fish off from his wharf at his uh, manor. Him and Martha had a happy last two years of marriage before, in December of 1799, Washington, Washington unfortunately passed away. It is commonly believed that he probably passed away of strep throat as he had kind of gone outside in the rain to check up on the crops in his field. It was cold, it was rainy, it was windy, and he came down with a very sore throat, which eventually got worse, and he eventually ended up succumbing to it. Maybe not because of the sore throat, but because of the factor that the doctors tried their little kind of outdated and dangerous methods of trying to cure someone back then, such as actually letting blood out. So that wasn't exactly a good thing. But he had like a sore throat, a fever, stuff that is kind of common to strep throat victims. So it's commonly believed that he probably had strep throat. But anyway, in December of 1799, Washington died. And Martha died a couple of years after him in 1801. And Washington did indicate in his will that his slaves that he had on his plantation were to be freed upon Martha's death. So that kind of ends George Washington's little story here about his presidency. Um, we have one more little image here. This is the portrait of George Washington that we probably have all seen at some point in our life. I highlight this. It was painted by Gilbert Stewart in about 1795-1796 toward the end of Washington's second term. We've probably all seen this painting at one point in our life, but they, uh, the reason I'm showing it is because supposedly this is supposed to be the most accurate painting of Washington ever done during his life. It's the most accurate portrait that was ever painted of him. Supposedly this is the most realistic looking por portrait of George Washington. And a fun fact, George Washington never smiled because, of course, as we all know, he had wooden teeth. And we might ask, well, why was that? Well, Washington constantly would do that because of one factor. And the reason he didn't smile, well, he had the wooden teeth because he lost all his teeth. But the reason that people ask, like, why did you not smile? And they kind of explain that Washington's wooden teeth were very loose fitting in his mouth. And he constantly would have to keep his mouth closed because if he tried to smile, like I, like I can smile like this. Well, if you try to do that and Washington tried to do this. His teeth were so loose, they'd plop right out of his mouth. They were that loose. So he didn't want to do a painting. And then, of course, you're going to have, like, hollow cheeks. And you could kind of tell that he didn't have teeth. So he constantly, like, during that portrait, he had his mouth closed to kind of keep his teeth in. That's why he always got the stern look. It wasn't because he was an upset man or a stern-looking guy. It was just because he didn't want his teeth, teeth plopping out. But anyway, that kind of concludes our video here for George Washington's presidency. If there are any questions that anyone might have, feel free to put that in the comment section below. I understand I might have left a few loose ends or might have forgotten something. Or if there was something I forgot, just mention it. So feel free to put that in the comment section below if you have any added details or questions that you would like me to answer. And I'll be more than happy to answer them. Uh, that concludes it for this video, so as always, do always, if you like the video, be sure to like it, be sure to hit the subscribe button if you like the videos that have been coming out or have any interest in the upcoming little presidential series here that we're doing. So that covers our first president, we only got 44 more to go. <laughs> so that will conclude this video. Um, I don't know exactly if we're going to do the next video on John Adams next week or not. We might kind of cover on something else. I don't want to do these all consecutively. We want to take our time with this, so kind of diversify. So I don't know what exactly we're going to do next week yet, so that we'll have to keep that in mind.
Hopefully everyone has a wonderful and happy and safe Thanksgiving, given the COVID crisis that is still ongoing in this nation and now supposedly is worse than it ever has been, at least in my state of Ohio, it's pretty bad. Like, we're at our largest and worst spike we've ever had, and it's honestly scaring me as to the ignorance that I'm seeing around other people. There's a lot of people going around me that I kind of know personally that are just like, oh, I think it's as I'll quote some that I've heard that it's no big deal or I just don't like wearing a mask or I think it's under control. I hate to tell you this, but if you're one of those people, you're living in fantasy land. You really are. And I hate to tell you this, but wake up and smell the roses because it ain't smelling pretty. The moment we can stop being ignorant about this virus and the moment we can start taking things seriously, that's when we'll get rid of this. Sitting at home and denying it does nothing. Going out in public without wearing masks or following what the uh, government has kind of told you and advised you that you need to do, that's not helping either. So if you're one of those people, shame on you. But I understand I have no power to make you do what you want to do. So you go ahead and write, you go wrong and write, do it. I'm just imploring you that if you want to see this come to an end, at least until we can get a vaccine out, which I heard some, we got some good news on that. So that's a good thing, but it's going to be a while still until we can get that really, it's distributed and some people aren't going to want to take it anyway. So I'm imploring you that if you're one of those people, wise up, get smart, don't act dumb. And just do what's asked. We can get over this thing and probably quicker than anything ever seen before. But you got to be willing to do your part. And when you're not doing your part, you're part of the problem. So anyway, that concludes for this. So have a happy Thanksgiving. Have a happy holiday little weekend. And hopefully everyone will hopefully do well and not get any of this COVID. So... That concludes our video for today, so as always, may God bless you all and have a happy Thanksgiving.